In the years following World War II, railroads in the United States faced a formidable challenge. With the interstate highway system moving freight at an unprecedented scale, and passengers turning to commercial aviation as the means of travel, railroads were losing business at an alarming rate. Never before had railroads faced such competition from domestic transportation. While some railroads opted to innovate to stay ahead, such as dieselization, some railroads opted to merge in order to maintain competitive. While merging were nothing new in railroads, many railroads found it difficult or nearly impossible to cooperate with each other. Some, though, would thrive via mergers. Running itself as the nation's first railroad, the Baltimore and Ohio had a long and distinguished history in American railroading, setting the bar high for other railroads to follow. By the 1960s, however, the B&O had fallen into financial hardship and found itself in a fierce survival of fittest battle between two railroads. The New York Central, led by President Alfred Perlman, wanted to merge with the B&O in order to survive as a company and stabilize its business. The Chesapeake and Ohio, on the other hand, wanted to acquire the B&O for its lucrative coal field routes into West Virginia to add to their already vast sums of coal traffic. Unlike other railroads in the region, the C&O was in good financial state, owing to its steady traffic of coal from the mines in the Appalachian Mountains. In the end, the C&O would win out and acquire a controlling interest in the B&O on December 31, 1962. Rather than merge the two companies, however, then CNO President Walter J. Tuohy chose to gradually merge the railroad's similar departments over time in order to not alienate the B&O employees as well as keep the B&O's tax exemption status within the state of Maryland. Following the acquisition of the B&O, the CNO approached the Interstate Commerce Commission in 1965 about acquiring the Chicago, South Shore, and South Bend Railroad to expand the CNO's reach into Chicago, which the ICC approved the year after. Shortly thereafter, in 1968, the B&O acquired a controlling interest in the Western Maryland Railroad, leading to the B&O and the C&O jointly controlling the Western Maryland. This acquisition created a direct link to Elkins, West Virginia, as well as supplied the C&O with another major coal hauler. With all these railroads in place, the C&O now had a conglomerate that supplied great riches for the Cleveland-based coal hauler. However, with all the new railroads to oversee, management of the C&O found it hard to manage three railroads with three separate business cultures and management. Hayes T. Watkins Jr. was always enthralled by a railroad since his childhood. After graduating from what is now Western Kentucky University, Watkins got a job with the CNO as a staff analyst in 1949. Over the next decade, Watkins raised to the ranks of the CNO upper management, becoming VP of Finance of both railroads by the 1960s, due largely to his knack with numbers. By 1971, Watkins had become CEO of both the B&O and the CNO. With increasing financial and operational strains of the three railroads, however, Watkins, along with the rest of the CNO upper management, began to think of how to better manage their railroads. The solution? Create a holding company to manage their three railroads. What would set this holding company apart, though, would be its unique business practices. Unlike most railroad mergers of the day, the holding company allowed semi-autonomy amongst the three railroads with eventual consolidation over time. This allowed for more flexibility and independence amongst the three railroads that allowed for operations which best suited their region. Using the former mascot of the CNO as the company's new emblem and a new colorful paint scheme designed by Franklin Carr, the Chessie System was born. Incorporated on February 26, 1973, acquisition of the three major railroads would be completed in July of that year. Based in Terminal Tower in Cleveland, Ohio, the Chessie stretched from Norfolk, Virginia to Beardstown, Illinois, and would go on to be a dominant rail player in the Northeast. Part of its success laid in its steady revenue of coal from the Appalachian Mountains. Alongside of coal, large sums of automobiles and automotive parts from Michigan also helped bolster Chessie's cargo shipments. The other part of Chessie's success lay in Watkins' commitment to a strong belief in a good company image. This would play over into public outreach events, such as the Chessie Steam Specials. Enlisting the help of Ross E. Rowland Jr. of the High Iron Company, the Chessie Steam Specials were held to commemorate the 150th birthday of the B&O and the subsequent birth of American railroading. This steam special would run in 1977 and 1978 with X Reading Board 4 number 2101 leading the train throughout its system-wide tour. After the success of the steam specials, the Chessie would again enlist the help of Rowland with the Chessie Safety Express. Led by XCNO 484 number 614, 
Safety Express would educate the public on railroad crossing safety from 1980 to 1981. This endeavor would lead to a 10% decrease in grade crossing accidents across the Chessie system in 1981. By the late 70s though, the Chessie system had begun to consolidate railroad operations and liquidate unprofitable lines from their system. Initially abandoning a large majority of the Western Maryland right-of-way, the Chessie system would eventually shutter more notable lines such as the b and extension to St. Louis. It was during this period that Watkins approached the Seaboard system about a merger. The Seaboard, consisting of the Louisville and Nashville, Seaboard Coastline, and other notable railroads, had a similar story to the Chessie as well as similar operating procedures. Influenced by the failure of the Penn Central a decade before, Watkins and Seaboard President Prime F. Osborne eventually agreed to a 50-50 merger. And so, on November 1st, 1980, the Chessie system and the Seaboard system merged to grade CSX Transportation, with C standing for Chessie, S standing for Seaboard, and the X standing for a multiplication factor of the two railroads. Some semi-autonomous operations would continue until 1983, when the Western Maryland was formally absorbed into the B&O, with the B&O merging into the C&O four years later. The Chessie system would formally merge into CSX and cease to exist as a company on August 31st, 1987. Despite being 35 years removed from the Chessie's demise, the memory of the Chessie system is not forgotten. Across the eastern United States, remnants of the Chessie can still be found in railroad museums, tourist railroads, and private venues. At the B&O Railroad Museum, former Chessie System GP40-2 number 3802 has been restored into its Chessie System colors and regularly pulls the museum's passenger trains. Outside of operations like Baltimore, remnants of the Chessie can still be found in small museums or even out on the main line across the country. Even CSX hasn't forgotten about its heritage. In 2017, CSX employees of the Huntington, West Virginia locomotive shop repainted former Chessie GEB30-7 number 8272 back into Chessie system livery and is now on display at the Lakeshore Railway Museum in Erie, Pennsylvania. CSX has even commemorated its heritage with a locomotive done up with the Chessie system decal. Beyond physical recognition though, the impact the Chessie system has left on American railroading cannot be understated. Chessie's business model of semi-autonomous operations and strong company image has played a huge role in how railroads operate today. The unique way in which the Chessie system chose to merge its three railroads laid the benchmark for other railroad mergers to follow. In an age where company image is everything, the emphasis on employee treatment and public perception is no doubt influenced by Chessie's business tactics. Despite being over 50 years removed from its inception, the impact the Chessie system has left on American railroads as a whole cannot be understated. If anything, it's the prime example to follow.